One weapon on today's battlefield would probably not seem out of place on the battlefields of the 14th century. Artillery cannons still depend on the 600-year-old idea of harnessing an explosive force to send a projectile down a tube. Considered in their early days as practitioners of a black art, gunners may have taken a half a day to send one shell a few hundred yards. Today, a well-trained gun crew can hit its target with certainty nearly 15 miles away, four times a minute. Division 2, 8, 8, 8. Quarter, 4, 5, 5. 4, 5, 5. Fuse quick. Fuse quick. Let's go, let's go. Grab on. Fire. 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 Firepower. Throughout history, there has been no substitute for superior firepower, and Desert Storm was no exception. As U.S. forces poured into the Gulf region, the artillery crews soon overcame the harsh surroundings and had their guns ready to inflict maximum damage on enemy targets, wherever it was needed. It's kind of difficult getting adjusted to shooting the house in the sand. But we had to have adapted and overcome that by putting plywood down underneath the base plate. This is the M1 old Deuce Howitzer 105 millimeter. Doing a lot of work with it out in Saudi Arabia, and it's been working good for us. It was the norm in Desert Storm to mass fires, which we're very, very good at. As a matter of fact, they mass fires up to 11 battalions on one target, what they call a TOT, time on target, so everything arrives at the same time. The use of artillery there was extremely impressive, and made a, a matter of fact, made a major contribution to seizing the objectives that they did. Today, computers and satellites enable fire direction control officers to process target information and relay it to the crews in seconds instead of hours. The fire direction officer is responsible for taking the incoming call for fire from the maneuver units, processing that fire order, and getting out information data to put on the guns in the fastest time possible with the minimal risk to any friendly troops that are in the area, which is zero. The number of guns the Iraqis actually had on the ground was probably as many, if not more, than the coalition forces. But the way the coalition forces artillery was organized, due, thanks to electronic computers, thanks to electronic networks, the information got straight back to the command points, went straight to the guns. So whenever one, some one poor unfortunate Iraqi gun fired, they were immediately covered with saturation fire from every gun that was anywhere in there, that the coalition forces could coordinate their fire so rapidly that as soon as an Iraqi gun was fired, it was virtually silent. One of the most effective of Desert Storm's guns was the M198 155mm howitzer. The M198 is today's state-of-the-art field gun, able to fire six rounds per minute with a range of over 18 miles. The quick and accurate striking ability of today's guns, along with well-trained crews and modern communications technology, all combined to create such intense and immediate firepower that there was often little resistance encountered when the infantry arrived. The 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One, when they initiated their attack to go through the berm, they laid down about 6,000 rounds of ammunition and about 400 rockets. The result of that was so great that when they went through that berm, they did not get any counterfire from the Iraqi artillery. They didn't have any casualties. And they were able to move through there almost without any resistance whatsoever. But in order for the incredible guns of today to exist, some very basic problems had to be overcome, not the least of which was the need for stronger metals to allow for bigger and more durable guns. 
The Industrial uh, Revolution made possible great advances in the manufacture of refined steels that, that size volume for volume were much stronger and much lighter than the old wrought iron and other materials that had been used before. At first, these newer, bigger guns were basically the same as their predecessors, but in a matter of 40 years, an amazing series of innovations totally revolutionized this 600-year-old weapon. Rifling came first. What that, in fact, is, it's grooves inside the barrel that twist the projectile as it, as it is pushed down the barrel. Now, this twist makes the projectile spin. And so, therefore, it stays much more stable in flight for much longer. You point a gun at a target with a pretty fair realization you're going to hit it. A rifled barrel also allowed for a longer, more accurate projectile, which could deliver a larger explosive payload than the cannonball of old. But the gunners still needed a faster means of firing. The old muzzle loading days, you had to go around the front go away with, with ramrods and all that sort of thing, and it was a long and involved process. With breech loading, all you had to do was quite simply open the breech, bang in another shot and cartridge, and you're off again. Despite all of these advances, a well-trained gun crew could still only fire one or two rounds a minute. But in a dramatic culmination of available technology, a Frenchman named Puteau created his 75 millimeter field gun in 1897. The first truly modern gun had arrived. What it did was it combined breech loading, the new ammunition rifling with a new elongated shell, and it combined all these with a recoil mechanism. Up till that point, guns, when they fired, all, they just literally moved to the rear, because as the shell went out the front, the basic Newtonian laws, the gun moved to the rear. What happened was they actually worked out a way whereby the barrel would slide to the rear under spring or, hy or hydraulic pressure and then go back to its former position without the carriage moving at all. You could literally fire the gun as quickly as you could put ammunition to the back. And it had such an effect on warfare that in 1914-18, it was one of the most important guns on the Allied side. German engineers had also been making improvements on some very large guns, which would be unveiled in the great war that loomed on the horizon. Some of the first shots fired in World War I were from the monstrous Krupp 42 centimeter howitzers, which soon became known as Big Berthas. The 42 centimeter um, howitzer, known as the, generally as the Big Bertha, was a massive, great fort crusher. It was the, one of the largest caliber guns then built. Basically, it fired a very large and heavy shell packed with explosive in such a way that it would plunge down onto fortifications and literally drive its way into the fortification before it actually exploded. Without the use of the Big Bertha, those forts would have held up the German army for quite some weeks, if not months, as it was, they were able to smash them their way through in a matter of days, making possible the big sweep through Belgium and into northern France. Before long, the Allied guns, particularly the French 75, helped to stop the German advance about 20 miles outside of Paris in the massive First Battle of the Marne. The French gunners confidently fired round after round out in the open, and the volume of fire from their 75s crushed entire infantry columns in seconds. The German artillery effectively countered from concealed positions and made the French gunners pay dearly for firing in the open. But as men and resources on both sides began to wear thin, the Germans temporarily abandoned their goal of reaching Paris. And the stalemate of trench warfare soon set in. The cost of lives at the Marne had been high, with French losses alone, totaling more than 300,000 men in August and September of 1914. Fully one-sixth of their total casualties for all of World War I. Trench warfare. Both sides on the Western Front had firmly dug in, 
and a similar situation was taking place on the Eastern Front as well. Even massive artillery bombardments, which lasted for days, could not always ensure an advance by the infantry. One type of artillery which was particularly well suited for the trenches was the mortar. The mortar was an, an old weapon that was reinvented during the Great War. What it does is it actually fires at a very high angle of elevation so that the projectile goes up and comes down at a very, very steep angle and actually reached down into the trenches directly to uh, hit the targets. One of the main uses for the mortar in World War I was to project a new and deadly weapon into the enemy's trenches, toxic gas. Gas warfare is a terrible monster. You think you're a goner, you choke, you can't see, and you burn to be hell. You just think you're a goner. You're going to die right there. It's a terrible feeling. But most of the casualties were still caused by the big guns. With fairly static fronts, both sides had time to bring heavy artillery into position behind the front line. The most powerful of these were the railway guns. The railway guns of World War I were mounted on railway mountings. This was quite simply because they were so big and heavy, there was no way that they could be taken at any great speed over the roads behind the battle areas. They could then be shunted along to any part of the uh, battle front, and it was used to uh, reach right into the German rear areas, smash up railway stations, smash up supply areas, smash up dormitory areas to very great effect. The Germans did much the same sort of thing, but in the main, when it came to railway guns in the First War, the Allies had the edge. By far the longest reaching and most mysterious piece of artillery during World War I was the German Paris gun used as a terror weapon against the citizens of Paris in 1918. The gun fired shells into the city from somewhere in the Saint-Gobain woods over 70 miles away. It consisted of a very, very, very long gun barrel. I think it was oh, about 156 calibers long, whereas most guns at the time were as 30 or 40 calibers was long. And it, from a, a range of 72 miles and hidden away in a forest, it could literally rain shells on Paris. It was 72 miles away from the front line. Nobody had ever heard of a gun firing that distance. It initially had a great morale impact on the French, but the number of casualties inflicted on Paris and, and the, the citizens was relatively minor. Many shells just fell in empty space in the street, in parks, although it was an extraordinary technical feat for the time. Its military uh, effectiveness was virtually nil. Gradually, the introduction of new weapons, such as the tank and the airplane, helped restore mobility to the battlefield. As soon as these new inventions arrived, the artillery units of both sides began to counter them. At first, existing guns, like the French 75, the German 77mm field gun, and the Russian 76mm Putilov, were simply placed on special mounts to fire at planes or used at low trajectories to counter enemy tanks. Gradually, a few specialized guns appeared, but none of these new guns were very effective, usually requiring 3,000 shells fired for every airplane brought down. As the war ended, Allied artillery and other forces could claim supremacy. But in the years to come, this feeling of superiority also created a certain amount of complacency on the Allied side, while German research in the black art of artillery continued in secret. A new era of more effective and more specialized weapons lay on the horizon, and the rising Nazi party was prepared. World War I had been a fairly straightforward conflict where the duties of the artillerist had remained, for the most part, what they'd always been. But in World War II, the warring armies were quickly drawn into a deadly race against technological defeat. 
Most allied countries were unprepared for this new race, still relying on guns of World War I vintage. Hitler's army was clearly in the lead. The nation that was perhaps best situated in 1939 for, for a modern artillery war was Germany. Because after 1918, the Treaty of Versailles virtually removed all the artillery they had. So they were free in clandestine conditions to develop a whole new family of artillery. And by 1939, they were well on the way to producing those guns in great numbers, which is what modern war requires, not just modern guns, but large numbers as well. The U.S. Army had decided to modernize its gun designs just after the First World War, but large-scale production never began, leaving the troops to train with older guns like the French 75. It's an amazing weapon because it was developed in 1897, and it lasted all these years, and we were still using it for training in, in 41. It was a very fine and accurate weapon, but we needed something that would have more range and more lethality. But it's the only thing we had for training. Uh, some of the other troops didn't have that. They had logs that'd sit across something and uh, use that for training. But as the threat of another great war became a reality, American industry swung into action, producing guns that would set the standard for years to come. The M2 105 millimeter howitzer and the M1 155 millimeter howitzer led the way in the transition from the French 75. The new self-propelled class of guns was also a significant improvement. First developed at the end of World War I, these new guns helped to increase a unit's total firepower by providing better mobility and flexibility. This new class was a great complement to the existing towed class of artillery. One of the most effective of these guns was the 155 millimeter Long Tom. We went from the 105, we had the 155, and 155 self-propelled, 155 towed. The long tom was a weapon that could reach way out there. It was a gun and not a howitzer. But the workhorse at that time was the 105. Still large numbers of these improved US guns were not ready in time to stop the blitzkrieg attacks in which artillery played a key role. they would suddenly lay down vast areas of fire from artillery pieces. They would be supplemented by dive bombers. They would be supplemented by the infantry mortars. Anything that could be brought to bear on one particular area of landscape where the unfortunate enemy was would be saturated. They would be saturated to such a point that when the armor moved forward, there was virtually nothing to stop it. It would pour through that gap. And as they poured through, the artillery would move out and prevent the enemy moving in from the flanks. One of the most important and versatile of the German guns was the 88 millimeter Flak 18. Developed in secret beginning in 1933, the 88 proved to be very effective against enemy tanks, planes, and troops in the field as well. The muscle velocity of the 88, that was the real reason that you could aim really point blank at a tank. And if you had a thing like that with a relative high reload capacity, you really had examples where one gunner, they killed a battalion of tanks with three guns within an hour or two. A comparable US gun brought into service in 1942 was the 90 millimeter Baby Long Tom, whose effectiveness against enemy infantry, tanks, and planes led to it being known as the triple threat. Of the more than 5,000 V-1 rockets launched in Antwerp, Belgium, only 211 got past the Baby Tom's defenses. But more than versatility, it was the U.S. Army's ability to concentrate the fire from many guns onto a single target that led to its superiority. World War II was the, uh, the apex or the high point as far as the artillery use uh, in, in our history. And it re the reason it was was not because we had that much better weapons or that much better ammunition, but it was because we were very flexible. And the main thing is we could mass our fires from many locations. Uh, <clears throat> we could sometimes put 8, 10, 20, 30 battalions on some of the critical targets. This is something that most of the other artilleries couldn't do. 
Good communications were vital to coordinating an artillery barrage. The telephone had been used by artillerists during the First World War, but radio and other improvements brought the rapid processing and transmission of target information to a new level. We had a fire direction center, we had observers, we had survey locations. So in case we found a lucrative target, we could bring in artillery from many battalions, and if it was a surprise fire, which we tried to get all the time, we could bring eight, eight battalions and all the projectiles would arrive at the same time and that would have des devastating effect. Such efficient communication combined with mobility and the concentration of firepower placed the U.S. artillery above all the rest. The Russian artillery in World War II used to get their mass fires by putting their weapons hub to hub. We didn't do that. We had our weapons spread out over a large area and they'd converge on the target, but they had a lot more weapons and they'd put them hub to hub and shoot out there and mass their fires that way, which uh, was not very efficient because you could locate them easily and they didn't move that much. We moved around because the thing to do then is if, you, if, they have, if your enemy has artillery and they spot you, you better shoot and move out so that they don't uh, fire counter battery fire. The Germans had two problems. One of the problems was that they never were able to mass the fires with the responsiveness to the infantrymen and to the armor that we were. Another problem that they had was that it was amazing how much horse-drawn artillery they had. So they didn't respond as quickly as we did. They couldn't go into position as quickly. They were, of course, hampered by horse-drawn artillery. And they didn't have the fire direction system that we had. But the Germans did have one extraordinary means of generating firepower, and its name was Gustav. The 80-centimeter railway gun is one of those things which, even now, I, I just, it's, a, a subject of fascination to, our, to anybody interested in artillery matters. It was the biggest gun of all time, and that's the sole reason why it was built. It was a Wagnerian obsession by Hitler and the Nazi regime to have something that was bigger, that would really be absolutely the greatest gun of all time. And it was a whopper. The thing, the shells was, 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 were, were taller than a man. The caliber, the actual width of the barrel was 800 millimeters. To actually service the man it, it took a battalion manpower strength. But it was only ever used once in action, and that was Sevastopol in 1943. It was very, very effective, but the actual manpower resources of getting that gun across Europe and actually getting it into action and firing it was such that it actually diverted manpower away from the main attack. I always like to think that gun helped the Allies win the Second World War in its own quiet way. Soon US artillery superiority helped to turn the tide of the war. Blitzkrieg was now a memory, and the Allies were on the advance. After the invasion of Normandy, artillery helped the Allies to break out from the beaches and began their move across the countryside. Soon, Germany's vaunted Siegfried defensive line was penetrated, and the Allies advanced farther into Nazi territory. I remember the uh, crossing of the Rohr River where we were stymied for a while. And uh, they massed the artillery fires, everything they could get there, including tanks and, uh, and tank destroyers and so forth. And we started off early in the morning, and it was the most awesome thing I've ever seen, really. Uh, I, don't, I think we, we fired about 30 battalions on a particular area, and you could read a newspaper at night. There were so many guns firing, it, it was daylight. And uh, the roar of them was very devastating. It was very, very effective. And uh, I'm sure the fire at the other end was very effective also. The United States was also making advances in the Pacific, where artillery's basic task remained the same, half a world away. The role of artillery is to support the infantry or the armor in their operations. In the Pacific, with the jungles that they met in the initial phases of the war, and the island hopping, they had an entirely different way of using artillery and attempting to support the troops that they had. And I would say, having fought in Europe, their job to support the infantry in the Pacific 
was much more difficult than we had. As World War II neared its final stages, the Allies were clearly winning the technological race. At the Battle of the Bulge, another innovation was unveiled, known as the variable time or proximity fuse. With older fuses, the gunners would have to estimate how long it would take for the shell to arrive just above the enemy, where its explosion would cause maximum damage. This was a difficult task, and shells would often detonate too late in the ground or too early high in the air. The VT fuse used a radio signal which bounced back to the shell from the ground and detonated at the most effective height every time. As a result of that, you've got an extremely effective pattern of burst above the ground and extremely effective in the case of, uh, of the enemy uh, either marching, uh, moving back and forth or in their foxhole. Well, that was a major improvement in fuses at that time. Rockets, although not an entirely new innovation, had come back into favor after being replaced by more accurate artillery pieces some 80 years before. Rockets were quickly mass-produced by the Allied and Axis armies, and even though they still lacked accuracy, their saturating volume of fire could be quite effective. But the greatest technological advance of all brought the war quickly to a close and marked the dawning of the new atomic age. As the age of atomic weapons emerged, scientists soon discovered that artillery could harness this awesome power. The 280 millimeter gun, known as Atomic Annie, became the first piece of artillery to fire a shell capable of delivering a nuclear payload. That shell could, could easily be delivered by a, a rocket. It could be delivered by an aircraft. Where the gun, the atomic gun, or atomic cannon, call it what you will, scores over those methods, is that you can keep on delivering them accurately at any time of the day or night, under any circumstances. And that's it's even now. Conventional artillery can fire atomic projectiles, and many, many guns in the field uh, are equipped with, with atomic projectiles even to this day. But Atomic Annie was so big and so heavy, it was difficult to move, and it fell out into disuse, not because it was an atomic gun, but because it was such a bitch to move. Still, there was a very immediate need to continue improving conventional artillery as war broke out in Korea. And even though many of its guns had remained the same since World War II, the U.S. artillery had improved its ability to coordinate fire. One of the things they did in Korea that we did not do in, in, in Europe was use the box barrage. There they had a, if you had an art, uh, infantry battalion or some type of unit on a, on a hill mass being attacked by a tremendous number of Chinese. As you know, they outnumbered it tremendously in, in Korea. They put down a line of fire on both sides of that battalion, and a line of fire in front of that battalion line of fire behind a battalion, and that became a box. When everybody was coordinated, they would lift the line of fire to the rear so the battalion could evacuate and withdraw and come back out of that whole box barrage. But that requires a tremendous expenditure of ammunition, and it requires a tremendous amount of coordination. But the enemy in Korea was very elusive aided by the difficult terrain. It was mountainous. They could dig in, they could get behind a hill where you couldn't see them, you couldn't find them with the air observers. So uh, trying to get exactly on the enemy was very, very difficult. And then they had forests, and uh, mainly it was because it was mountainous. And uh, they could hide very easily. And they could dig in very easily. So targets were difficult to find. And once you did find them, they were difficult to hit. 
On the rare occasions when UN forces did catch the enemy in the open, the effect of the artillery was devastating, as in the Wanzhou shoot of 1951. Aerial observers spotted two or three North Korean infantry divisions moving across an open area and immediately called for artillery support. With the advances in fire direction techniques and communications, the response was almost immediate. After only three hours of firing, the North Korean divisions were utterly destroyed. Over 3,500 soldiers dead in that short amount of time. Once again, artillery proved that it could overcome harsh surroundings and operate efficiently in any type of weather, 24 hours a day. The conditions in Vietnam proved to be equally inhospitable. In Vietnam, I, I visited some units who were in water, practically, in very terrible situations, uh, where they were in water all the time. Trying to fire from that position is extremely difficult. The terrain was awful, awful. Whether you were in the jungle with the high trees or whether you were in a delta with the water. The nature of the terrain, in most cases, forced the artillery units to use their firepower in an unusual way. The difference in the role or the use of artillery was the fact that we had artillery in, in fire support bases. This was a great perimeter berm. It might be a few hundred yards across, or it might be a half a mile. It might have one artillery battery of four guns, or two or three, or a whole battalion, or maybe two battalions sitting there. And you could interlock the fires between one fire support base, another fire support base, and mass them out there, not only to support infantry operations, but to help defend other fire support bases. In this unique and decentralized battlefield, mobility was at a premium. Where the terrain permitted, improved self-propelled guns like the 175 millimeter model and the 155 millimeter M109 were used with great effectiveness. In the Delta regions, barges often provided a floating firing platform, allowing the gunners to bring their fire to bear wherever it was needed. But as new metals such as aluminum alloys allowed guns to be built stronger and lighter, an unmatched form of mobility was perfected. The helicopter became a, a major uh, support to artillery units by being able to carry not only guns to areas that where they wouldn't otherwise get, but to keep them supplied when they were in action. Everything had to be brought in by chopper. In many cases, that was the only way to go. And we moved the 105 millimeter howitzer by chopper, and you can move the uh, 155 millimeter howitzer by chopper. In most circumstances, after an area was made suitable for artillery emplacement by engineers, helicopters were used to bring the guns in, creating a fire support base. The concentration of fire from these bases often denied enemy troops the freedom of movement through entire sections of jungle. This made the bases a prime target in the eyes of the opposition. November 1968. 800 North Vietnamese came across the border through that jungle, broke through the burn, over the burn, and came in and got amongst the artillery positions in there. And there was ferocious hand-to-hand -hand fighting. They finally drove them out, with them having many casualties. The artillery fired 1,300 rounds of direct point like fire over top of that berm at the enemy coming at them. That time, they used a, what we call the beehive round. The beehive round, and this is a projectile, has a lot of flechettes in it. The flechette is a little dark about that 
big with my finger. I had a little arrowhead on the front, a little bit slimmer than the finger, and the fins on the back. And they're all in this round. When you fire it, it goes out and it spreads in an ever-increasing plume. And it's called beehive because it sounds like a, a million swarm of bees going through the air. Devastating, absolutely devastating. As developments continued, other types of shells started using smaller charges within the larger shell, like the improved conventional munition round, which delivered many highly explosive grenades called submunitions. If you could put a density of fragments out there, it was pretty uniform. And if you were under that, you're going to get it. With normal artillery projectiles, you may get a big piece over here and a little piece over there, and you may, may be someplace in the middle and not even get hit. But with something like this, where you have uniform coverage of little pellets, uh, controlled fragments, uh, you're going to cover the area, and there's no one going to be able to withstand that. Computers were also emerging as another way to make artillery more efficient. Originally used to speed up calculations and to store firing data, for future reference, computers have completely revolutionized the amazing guns of today. Folks, ready? Start five weapon. I see red. All right. Witness my salon. Two niner, niner, niner. Priming. Stand by. Fire. Today, computers and electronics allow artillery to respond more quickly and with better accuracy than ever before. The use of electronics at the fire control center meant that the time from seeing a target to firing at it was compressed considerably, grew much shorter, and it was possible to engage targets that once upon a time gunners wouldn't have, wouldn't have thought of uh, engaging, such as uh, an even individual tanks. Once upon a time, the only way to hit an individual tank was to get a whole battalion's guns and fire it at that general area and hope you'd hit it. Now, you could even talk to one particular gun and uh, way over the horizon and stand a pretty good chance of hitting that to one individual tank. A perfect example of this new striking ability is the M109A6 155mm howitzer known as the Paladin. Instead of having a battery of four artillery pieces. The Paladin will be an individual weapon. It can move around under the command of a sergeant. It doesn't need any wire communications. It doesn't need any survey, because it gets its uh, position from the satellites up above. It has uh, computer systems. It uh, has the ability to fire fairly fast. As a matter of fact, it will be able to put a, a shot up like this, sort of high angle, another shot lower angle three or four or five, and have them all arrive out there on the target that's at the same time. Once the Paladin receives a fire mission, it can find a suitable firing position, compute its own firing data, fire on the target, and be ready to move again, all under 75 seconds. It is this ability to shoot and move avoiding enemy counterfire that makes the Paladin such a valuable asset on the modern battlefield. Towed artillery is still making advances as well, such as the M119 105mm light gun produced in Britain and the United States. This gun is almost 1,000 pounds lighter than earlier 105mm models providing airborne divisions and special forces with a mobile and versatile source of firepower. But more and more of today's artillery is self-propelled. Even rockets and missiles have become self-propelled and computerized like the multiple launch rocket system used in Desert Storm and the even newer tactical missile system. These new systems give the artillery a long-range striking capability of over 60 miles. Take the MLRS. It has uh, 12 rockets, 
sticks on either side. You can fire out there many, many miles and lay down a devastating amount of rockets on a particular area. Then one that's coming into being now is called the Tekkens. Uh, it uses the same launcher as the MLRS. It has fewer rockets in it, but it has a longer range, carries a lot more submunitions. By far the most revolutionary gun of today is the Defender. Still in its towed prototype form, the Defender will be a self-propelled 155 millimeter howitzer similar to the Paladin. And like the Paladin, it will be able to act as a one-gun battery firing shells at different trajectories so they converge on the target simultaneously. But the Defender has two additional features. One of the major um, technological uh, innovations that's coming in right now is the use of liquid explosives at different propellants as opposed to the old solid propellants. Rather than a gunner pushing a, a shell up, up the, into the chamber and adding a propelling charge, he'll put the shell in only, probably by some sort of automated means, and then an automatic system will inject a certain amount of liquid propellant in an aerosol form, possibly, into a chamber, ignite it, and off goes a shell in the conventional fashion. So instead of having a vast magazine of solid charges on, the, on our theory of the future, we're going to have a tank, rather like a petrol tank, from which the liquid propellant can be used. But even though technology may change gun design of the future, the basic role of artillery will remain the timely delivery of inescapable firepower. This is a big weapon here. The grunts don't have anything big like this. They need fire support where they're getting overran. They would call us back, and we would give them fire support so they can accomplish their mission. Artillery still prepares the way for any attack. Infantry, armored or combined arms, whatever. Artillery clears the way. No matter what battle you can look at, back to the Great War, the Desert Storm, artillery functions remain much the same. In an age where weapons have grown so sophisticated, stealthy and smart, artillery still retains one rare characteristic. It remains the only guaranteed all-weather, day or night fire support system immune to interference by electronic means. Once the shell leaves the gun, nothing can prevent it landing where it's aimed. This simple power and brute force led Joseph Stalin to declare artillery the god of war.